This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now here's Ted with Chef Daniela Manrique Luca. My guest today has competed multiple times on Canada's Great Kitchen Party, formerly known as the Gold Medal Plates, where she received a bronze, a silver, and a People's Choice Award. She is a chef judge on the latest installment of Food Network Canada's Wall of Chefs and is the co-owner of Ottawa's very popular uh, The Soka Kitchen, along with a number of other establishments, which we will get in in moments from now. But right now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Chef Daniela Manrique Luca. Nice to meet you, Chef. Thank you for joining me. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Oh, nice to meet you. I appreciate you taking the time. I, we, we have to take people, uh, the listeners here, on, on a bit of a, a, a voyage, your voyage, uh, how you got to where you are now, which is in, in, in Ottawa, because it's a fascinating story. You're born and raised in, in Venezuela mm-hmm. till the age of about, what, 10? Yes, around 10 years old, where I moved to Montreal. And how long was your family? Uh, so we we're four four children and then yeah my parents so we're we're a large family (laughs) okay so you come to montreal at the age of 10 you graduate from high school in montreal at which point you decide you know what i think i'm gonna go to fort lauderdale in florida and uh (laughs) and study culinary arts at the fort lauderdale culinary arts school which you did and while but while you were doing that which really amazes me at the same time, while you're studying, you're working in some high end, I mean, high end Miami restaurants. How did you fall that off? Yeah, so when I was studying there, I was really inspired, obviously, um, by all the food around me in the Caribbean. You know, it's where I grew up, really, in Venezuela. We have a lot of seafood and, you know, the beaches and everything. So in Florida, I kind of find something very similar to what I was accustomed to in Venezuela. So I thought it was, you know, a uh, really fun place to kind of um to to kind of you know experiment with those ingredients close to home but not home not quite home and uh yeah i decided to study there and then inspired by everything around and so then you decide time to leave florida move back to venezuela so you can study in and receive your master's degree in business management and i'm assuming you're doing that at this point because you've got plans of ownership in the future for a restaurant exactly and so at in florida i learned everything technical kitchen wise um i learned a lot about the food the ingredients and the technicality of cooking uh, but i felt that i needed that business aspect of it as well in order to i of course always have it in mind to open my own restaurant um i needed that business side as well so that's where i went to venezuela for that and at this point you've decided though that you want to be a chef but you need to know how to run a business at the same time. Otherwise, one can't exist without the other. Fortunately, you, your husband, uh, Gustavo Belisario, he's, uh, he's a business guy. Now, both of you at this time when you, when you, when you moved to, to Ottawa to open your first restaurant, you're only 27, 28 years of age. That's, that's a fairly young age for, uh, to begin in the restaurant industry. Correct. It was kind of, um, it was a gamble, right? Uh, We started working from Venezuela. We started looking at different spaces online and kind of working on a business plan and everything from Venezuela. And -hmm. then when we moved here, we kind of took action and started, you know, sold everything we had in Venezuela and uh, just moved here and risked it all for, you know, to open this first restaurant. Called the Soca Kitchen, S-O-C-A. Yes. What's the meaning behind the name? So my husband's family had a sugarcane um, field in Venezuela. Mm-hmm. And Soka is actually the name for the sugarcane uh, plant. When you cut it, the second time it grows, uh, it's called the Soka. And uh, yeah, we decided to name it on, you know, honoring that side of my husband's family and their sugarcane field crops in Venezuela. 
So you're in Ottawa now and you're opening up, which is really what, a fusion restaurant, kind of a cross between uh, Spanish and Mediterranean? Correct. So again, I'm bringing a little bit of my roots, my Latino roots into this, um, as well as my Spanish training, which mm-hmm. I did a lot in Miami, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I had a lot of training in Spanish cuisine and Mediterranean cuisine. So I kind of fused those two together, which is uh, two of my favorite cuisines to eat and to cook. <laughs> so that's how it came about. And how did the locals take to your, your selection, your menu, when you first opened? You know, when we first opened, I had the inner chef in me wanted to do a lot of different, super creative plates. Um, and then my husband's an accountant, so he kind of crushed a little bit of, you know, most, some of my dreams <laughs> at the <laughs> first year or two. Um, and uh, yeah, at first, I think it was a menu that I feel in Ottawa, Ottawa wasn't really ready for it yet. Um, back in 2014, I feel a lot of the plates were kind of, you know, so new here um, that I had to do some adjusting for sure the first year or so. I toned it down a little bit in the sense that it maybe was too Latino forward, too Spanish forward. I had to bring bring it down a notch and kind of, you know, uh, restructure it a little bit and then come up with a friendlier menu. Mm-hmm. And I feel that um, we reached a point a few years after we reached a point where it was kind of more accepted. Well, it, it, for some people in, in North America, no, let's say Canada anyway, um, the concept of having a fish delivered on their plate whole, head and everything, is, mm-hmm. is an uncommon one and not, not, not particularly comfortable with that. It, it takes a while for people to get used to those kinds of plates, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> when a lot of people order fried fish, they just assume it's just going to be a little, you know, fried fillet. And, and no, we always have to tell them, okay, it's head to tail, it's the whole thing. Or, you know, we used to have like the hamachi, tiradito, like the raw fish. Now, of course, it's a lot more, it's seen everywhere. But the ceviche, for example, that's not cooked, it's cooked in citrus. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it takes a little bit of time for, you know, our for a crowd it took a little bit of time, longer time to just kind of get used to it. But now I feel like they, they, they love it. You know, they Ottawa has come a long way in the culinary field. So you, this, this project begins in Ottawa and I'm speaking with chef Daniela and Menrique Luca, who is one of the chef judges on uh, uh, the uh, wall of chefs, which is a presentation to food network Canada. You can see it Monday nights at 10 o'clock. You open up in 2014, things are going along well, Suddenly, 2020 rears its ugly head. How did the pandemic affect you? So it affected us tremendously. Uh, tremendously. Um, of course, it was always we always wanted to branch out to delivery and takeout, but we we're never quite ready for it. We we're never, you know, no, our food is not for this for takeout. No, our food is not. And it was kind of we were forced to do that. But now it's a it's a good thing that we actually were able to experiment that whole new business of uh, delivery and takeout as well as we've branched out and now we have our own market as well um selling our products that we make in house and we also import a lot of things from spain that we have in the market so it kind of it pushed us in a way where we had to you know it was hard at first but now looking back um it really did kind of there's a bright side to it it kind of helped us to grow our business so currently you've got two restaurants in in Ottawa, um, and both called the Soka Kitchen, correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. And then you've got um, the Plantain Catering. The Plantain Cartel. A it's cartel. Uh, yeah, it's this, uh, the Soka Kitchen's little sister restaurant, which is more like a Latino street food uh, mm-hmm. based on a plantain-based menu with patacones, which are plantain sandwiches. And uh, it's just it's a more casual approach. Mm-hmm. That was developed during the pandemic, especially, you know, for delivery and pickup just to kind of um, help us in that transition. Okay. Well, here we are. As we record this interview, today is the uh, is the 18th of January, and uh, we're in a bit of a lockdown where the restaurant industry is in pretty much yeah. complete lockdown other than, than takeout and delivery. Are you managing to survive through this? I mean, here we go again, right? Uh, we're uh, kind yeah. of... It, it hurts a lot. What hurts the most is the open, close, open, close, because we, we don't have a lot of notice, even though we were expecting it to come. We kind of didn't know exactly when. 
So then again, we're stuck with inventory and it's perishable inventory and we're stuck with all these things. But we are also quicker to bounce back into, okay, let's go into takeout and delivery mode. So we kind of already have the systems established for that. So it just it's it's getting a little bit easier per se. I mean, never, of course, compared to just being open like a any regular business. But um, we are able to bounce back in this hybrid mode, you know, uh, a bit, a little bit easier than last year. And and of course, chef, with this constant opening and closing, opening and closing, consequently, uh, it's difficult mm-hmm. to get people to come back to work for you because they're thinking, well, I can go back and work there, but what if the government shuts it down again in three months from now, and here I am again? Aren't I better off going to find a sector that I think is going to be steadier throughout this pandemic? Should it keep going up and down the way it has been? Absolutely, I think that's been one of the hardest parts of the constant lockdowns that we have to you know what we do with our staff so right now we actually built a tent in front of one of the restaurants that we have quite a large patio uh, we're able to do like a heated tent just in ter- it's not even about the tent it's about to being able to keep some of our staff and keep them active and keep them employed with us you know because it's so hard once you have to constantly you know, let them go and then hire them back. And then, you know, the, it's it's a lot of instability for them. So mm-hmm. like you're saying, they're looking for other sectors to go work or they're just, you know, um, kind of weighing it out. And, and it, it's, it's very, very tough all around. Um, so we are trying to, instead of, you know, some restaurants up to just closing, they're like, okay, we'll just close for the whole lockdown. I don't know how they can support that, but uh, we are trying to do everything we can, you know, delivery, pick up tents, whatever we can do to just, keep the ball going and keep them employed and keep them with us, you know? And I know there's a lot of anger in the, in, in the, in the restaurant industry and understandably so because statistics prove that cases of, of, of COVID that have come from restaurants, the percentages is, 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 is minimal. It's like one or two or 3% are coming from restaurants, not, not bars, but restaurants and yet restaurants are being shut down completely. And, and, I don't understand it. I, I don't either. We're following all the protocols. They asked us to ask yeah. for the passports, the vaccine passports. We did. Absolutely everybody that comes in the door has to be vaccinated, including our staff. They're, everybody's vaccinated, double vaccinated. Um, so we're doing following all the protocols. As soon as you get up from your table, you have to be wearing your mask. Um, nobody's really, once they come in the restaurant, they sit at their table, they eat their dinner, and then they get up and leave. There's really no roaming around besides, you know, um, going to the washroom or something like that, very specific. But I mean, it's a very controlled environment. Um, so I, yeah, it, it leaves us where, you know, you can go to a shopping mall and nobody's checking a vaccine pass for there or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, tons of people go in and out. And here we are. We're the ones who are shut down. But. Ted and Chef Daniela will return after this. Well, let's head down to Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom Mahalik is there. People are going to be planning for weddings right about now, I would think, huh? Teddy, we're getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of requests. And my advice for everybody who's going to do a wedding this year, do it early. Do your shopping early. Do your research early. Start shopping for your wedding suits, your groomsmen's suit, the beautiful tuxedos. you got to... Do it early on. It's never too early to be ready. And right now we we are receiving all of our spring beautiful groomsmen suit, spectacular tuxedos. So right now the inventory looks like it's still strong. But don't wait, don't wait. I'm telling you, all the guys are saying, "Well, I got time. I got time." You don't have time. You got to start shopping for your wedding suits right now, and there's no better place than Tom's Place. You got it. 190 Ball, over the heart of Kensington Market. Hey, let me take a moment to tell you about my friends at Helenda's. They are the meat people. You know, I've been a fan of their products for years now, and without a doubt, they make some of the best sausage in Ontario. They are multiple award winners, having captured the Ontario's finest meat competitions, coveted award of excellence on three occasions in addition to dozens of individual product awards. Hollandez has also received the Grand Champion Ribbon at the past two Royal Winter Fairs Ready to Eat Meat Snack Competitions. 
So whether you're preparing a charcuterie board or a full-blown sit-down dinner for your friends or family, you'll find Helenda's award-winning products at fine meat shops throughout the province, now including selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland stores, along with their seven Helenda's locations. Their barbecued kielbasa is my favorite. On a fresh bun with horseradish, it is out of this world. But don't just take my word for it. Judge for yourself. On your barbecue, in your kitchen, or straight from the refrigerator. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And now let's get back to Ted and Daniela. I'm speaking with Chef Daniela Manrique Luca, who is one of the uh, celebrity judges, chef judges on the Food Network Canada's Wall of Chefs. This is its uh, second season. It's on Monday evenings at 10 p.m. Each week, there are a dozen different chefs, but in total, there are some 30-something that have been compiled for for the series, correct? Yes, roughly. Mm-hmm. So these dozen chefs, and we'll, we'll get into that, how, how this all happens. These are big, big names in, in the Canadian food industry. Um, heavy, heavy mm-hmm. hitters, M- M- Mark McHugh and Massimo Capra, Lynn Crawford, and the names go on and on and on. When you were first hired to be, become part of this team, how intimidated were you? Oh, definitely. Um, I was very shocked. Uh, I was very excited because I always love a competition. I love something different. I, I always put myself out there and uh, I enjoy it. Um, so I was very, you know, humbled also. I couldn't believe I was going to be invited for this. But uh, mostly excited, yes, to be able to talk to all these amazing chefs and, and hear what they have to say and hear their stories. And it's a, but, but it's a real camaraderie as well. I mean, because even, even though you're in competing against each other in one sense, you're not. I mean, Massimo's got a great restaurant in, in, in Mississauga, in the West End of, of Toronto. You've got places that are in Ottawa. So clearly you're not competing against each other. You're, you're colleagues. So I would imagine you'd probably be sharing feelings and thoughts and maybe even recipes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't think it was a competitive environment at all. I mean, maybe the home cooks, yes, but not for us. I think we're just, it it was kind of a place where we were just excited to be there and just kind of hearing each other out and, and, you know, talking about food, what we love, food and techniques and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, hearing everybody's story. Unfortunately, right now with COVID and the lockdowns and what everyone is kind of doing to survive, what we've been through, what we're going to do next. And, and it, it wasn't really a competitive environment, I would say. It was more of a, a supporting environment. It was it was very nice, yeah. For the chefs, supportive. Um, mm-hmm. For the for the home chefs, uh, very competitive. I mean, yes, exactly. You, you, you get you get. I think it's four different uh, home chefs per episode. Correct. Correct. Yes. And and it's broken down into three different categories. What are those three different categories of competition? So they have three different challenges. The first one is the party pleaser. So they get to make their favorite uh, dish, per se, the ones that they go to plate. Yeah. Um, then the next category, the next competition is the um, chef's fridge. So what we always have in our fridges, um, like three different items. And then the last round is the um, restaurant worthy meal. Um, they have to make you know, like a replica of a, one of the chef's um, plate. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it gets very competitive. Very. <laughs> Are you surprised at the quality of the chefs? The home chefs? I was. Yes. I, you know what? I was surprised and then also very inspired to see them, you know, put face all these challenges, all this uncertainty. You know, they have this you know, when they have like the fridge, uh, the fridge, right? This, these ingredients I've never seen before and uh, how to put them all together right at the moment, you know, with a time limit in front of all the chefs. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wouldn't be easy, not even as a chef, I think, you know, just to stand there in front of all the other chefs to kind of just come up with something in, in the moment, I think. Yeah, it was, it's very well, hard. I, I find it, I find, and I've, I've watched a number of episodes. I find it quite uh quite entertaining quite quite humorous when when you see some of the uh, the, the the home chefs are planning well they're going to make their own they're making a pasta dish but they're not just taking a box of pasta they're making homemade pasta and with that sauce and whatever the the ingredients would be and additional ingredients to that and you look at the reaction of the chefs and the chefs are saying oh my god she's going to make her own pasta in yeah. minutes. how could she do that 
<laughs> you know what? As chefs, I feel like we're judged all the time. So it's kind of like to be, you know, seeing people put themselves out there and like taking all these risks and, and it's just, it's nerve wracking, right? The, knowing that you're going to have to judge them on that. It's just, I don't know. The whole thing, it's, it's very entertaining. It's very nerve wracking. It's very fun. Um, I, I it, would, it was a great experience. To me, that would be a lot of fun being being a judge. To me, it'd be a lot a lot more fun <laughs> being a judge than being a competitor because I'm a, a mediocre, and that's patting myself on the back, a uh, chef. Uh, but to be a judge would be a lot of fun. Except the most difficult thing for me is, I I have I'd have a difficult time telling somebody, sorry, you got to go home. You know that, I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean that that was hard. Yeah. Um, being a judge, I thought it was one of the hardest parts because, again, we are judged daily on every food we put out. You know, someone's eating it, someone's judging yeah. it, yeah, yeah. and you kind of, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not that good, and and you hear about it for sure, and it's not oh. a great feeling. So then, having to sit there and having to judge these guys, or you know, doing the best they can, it was a little bit tough. But we'll have to watch and see what happened because and, and <laughs> I don't even remember. <laughs> And as I saw one of the coolest things the other night when I was when when I was watching just just last night, as a matter of fact, it ended in a tie. Mm-hmm. Two two chefs, two two female chefs split the ten thousand dollars. You get five thousand each. And I thought, way to go. You don't see that. that often. And I thought, well, yeah, because clearly both of their meals looked outstanding. And it's like, how do you decide? It's like if you're a, if you're a, if you're a sports player, it's like, how do you decide? who's the better hockey, baseball, basketball, tennis player. And it's a difficult thing to do. It's subjective. Exactly. Absolutely. And every home cook or every chef, they have their own style, their own, you know, ingredients, their own techniques. So it's, it's kind of hard. It's not like you're comparing apples to apples, right? Because it's, it's your style of cooking versus my style of cooking. They can both be absolutely delicious, yeah. but they're also different, right? Mm-hmm. And what he chose to do versus what she chose to do or, or you know, it's, they took different approaches, but they ended up with a really, really great product in the end. And it's just, you know, how to compare. It's, it's tough. It's tough decisions. I was going to ask you one, one final question here, chef. Yeah. When it comes to the point where the chef comes out, a chef comes out with their specialty plate and challenges the home cooks to present their specialty plate, what would be your specialty plate that you would present? My specialty plate, huh? Let me see. Okay, something that I've always, I've had it at the restaurant a couple of times and I've always wanted to bring it back. However, I haven't been able to just because of the logistics of it in general. It's the paella. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the paella would be one of, you know, rice. It's a really, it, it, it's really tough to get it right and to get it, you know, to the point. And um, I think that would be one of my signature dishes per se. Mm-hmm. Um, that I would absolutely, you know. And now, second question: Should I venture to the nation's capital to uh, to to Ottawa once this is all said and done and things are okay? We're walking around and going into restaurants. If I wander into your the Soka kitchen, what would I order? What would you suggest I order? Well, you already talked about the whole fried fish, so maybe you can try. <laughs> if you're not scared of, you know, the head to tail. Um, fish then definitely the whole fried fish would be nice uh the octopus salpicon as well is really good mm-hmm. um the ceviche you can try too Love with your seafood yeah mm-hmm. so this great. <laughs> so in, in right now in in ottawa you've got two soca kitchen locations and you've got the plantain cartel and plans to expand once the pandemic goes away or does whatever it's going to do <laughs> Absolutely, I'd love to expand, but right now I think we're we're good where we're at for for mm-hmm. a little bit, and then yeah. we'll see where the pandemic takes us. Because, um, yeah, it's so it's the uncertainty is too big right now. So, well, certainly hope uh, one day to be able to um, to make it to your restaurant in Ottawa, and I can continue to uh, to watch to see you on uh, Wall of Chefs. It's available Monday nights, ten p.m. Food Network Canada. Chef Daniela Manrique Luca, thank you very much for your time. All the best to you. Uh, thank you so much. All the best to you too, and hope to see you in Ottawa. You bet. Take care. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you.
and Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.